In a globally connected food system, a major disruption in one part of the world can have ripple effects far beyond their origin, sometimes with devastating consequences. War, such as the one in Ukraine, is just such a disruption. How will it be felt across the world? Let's ask. In Eid, Netherlands, the former head of the UN World Food Program, Ertherin Cousin, who is currently a distinguished fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and CEO of Food Systems for the Future. In Vancouver, British Columbia, Lenore Newman, director of the Food and Agriculture Institute at the University of the Fraser Valley and a Canada Research Chair in Food Security and Environment. And in Guelph, Ontario, Evan Fraser, director of the Errol Food Institute and a professor of geography at the University of Guelph, and we're glad that the three of you could spare some time for us here on TVO tonight. I'm going to start our discussion just by reading an excerpt from the New York Times, this from last week, and it goes like this. For the global food market, there are few worse countries to be in conflict than Russia and Ukraine. Over the past five years, they have together accounted for nearly 30% of the exports of the world's wheat, 17% of corn, 32% of barley, a crucial source of animal feed and 75% of sunflower seed oil, an important cooking oil in some parts of the world. David M. Beasley, the executive director of the United Nations World Food Program said, Ukraine has only compounded a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe. There is no precedent even close to this since World War II. Erthrin, I wonder, uh, having heard what uh, David Beasley had to say about this, I wonder how you would characterize the pressure now being felt on the global food supply. David's absolutely right. This is a, a looming, as the Secretary General has said, hurricane on the horizon. I was uh, serving as the U.S. Ambassador for Food and Agriculture in the aftermath of the 2007-8 food crisis and during the 2011 high food price uh, hunger crisis. And what we saw then was that was when hunger spiked around the world to about 1 billion people. And we know that today, as we are speaking, there are 811 million people who are food, food insecure. And that number increased by about almost 100 million as a result of COVID. And there's an expectation that this situation, and this is just a, a tipping point of challenges that have already begun because of lack of fertilizer, high gas prices, um, the, the spike in um, wheat futures. And then you have this availability challenge that results from the lack of export from Russia and Ukraine. And so that number of 811 billion, some are speculating, could again increase to over a billion people. And the number of those who are critically acutely hungry could increase from the 276 million today to another 100 to 100 to 150 to over 350 million people who are acutely hungry and that means without assistance there will be famines. Evan you just heard uh, me read that quote from David Beasley from the UN World Food, Food Program saying this was a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe. Is that being overly dramatic? No, I, I mean, I agree with Ambassador Cousin here. I mean, and, and, and the head of the World Food Program. Any one of the problems that Ambassador Cousin just listed on their own wouldn't necessarily trigger a global crisis. But when you've already got high food price inflation, uh, supply chain bottlenecks, low food stocks, this is another thing. The United mm -hmm. Nations tracks something called the supply to use ratio, which basically is a, a fancy way of saying how much food we've got versus how much we use. And, and the supply to use ratio is at its lowest point since I think 2015 or 2016. So you put all of these things together and, and you do have layers of catastrophe and a cascading ripple effect that, uh, that means that when you take uh, Russia and Ukraine, which are in amongst the world's top five uh, wheat exporters out of the equation for this year. Wheat importing countries such as such as Egypt and and North Africa, the Middle East, uh, will be in desperately t troubled situations. And 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 then the looming specter of famine and skyrocketing hunger around the planet. Uh, it's it's a terrifying moment. Lenore Newman, if you're a farmer in Ukraine right now, you obviously can't do what you want to do when there are bombs dropping all around you. So what's not happening right now that should be happening? Yes, well, obviously in Ukraine, we are seeing 
total disruption of uh, the farming cycle for the most part. It's uh, um, a long-held historic truth that war is particularly hard on farmers. Uh, but I think I have to stress, um, as my colleagues mentioned, it's the waves of disruption flowing out from that that are particularly damaging. And uh, I don't know that we've entirely mentioned yet the uh, disruption of fertilizer flow from Russia and Ukraine mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. also critical, and that's impacting uh, South America and Africa and well, the entire world as well. And as, as it has been mentioned as well, it's on top of three years of basic constant disruption, climate mm -hmm. change pandemic. And I'm usually an optimist and I usually say a well, one-off situation, the food system is really good at being resilient. This time, it's uh, there's fatigue. There's disaster fatigue, one could say. Hmm. Ambassador Cousin, uh, let me pick up on the fertilizer angle that Lenore New Newman mm -hmm. just brought up, because mm -hmm. it's not only Russia and Ukraine, but Belarus as well, that account for a huge portion of the world's fertilizers. Mm -hmm. What are the ripple effects of price for fertilizer going through the roof? Last week, I was in Rwanda, where I met with the Minister of Agriculture, and we went out to visit with farmers. And there's no fertilizer. And the, any, any farmer will tell you the crop that grows most productively in Rwanda is potatoes. And you can't grow fertilizer without potatoes. And the FAO has told us that any 30% reduction in fertilizer represents a 30% reduction in yield that could potentially impact about 100 million people not having access to food. So you think about the fact that there's a higher food price in the global food system and less production, particularly in for, with smallholder farmers in places that are, as a, as a group, net importers. And so you have less product produced locally and regionally, and you, as a result, you have, you, you have higher food prices for imports, which creates a challenge that we're, we traditionally are talking about how do we pro provide support for those who are chronically hungry. What we're talking about is working people who will no longer have the ability to afford bread. And so that means that we need to increase production of fertilizers to ensure that we're moving fertilizers into fertilizer into places where it's necessary, like Latin America and Africa, as well as in, in, in parts of Asia, where the 500 million farm smallholder farmers feed about 80% uh, of the population in their countries. Well, Evan, the trick with that, of course, is that uh, energy prices are going through the roof as well. How do you move that fertilizer to where it needs to go to when you've got to be spending twice or three times as much for energy? Well, I mean, again, we're just we're just describing the same problem. I mean, this is this is another aspect of these layers of catastrophe the world is mm -hmm. is facing right now. And and there's a, I think there's an important um, element that I, is worth is worth doubling down on because because in in a place like Canada, soils are pretty deep, pretty organic, pretty well managed in general. So there will be a lot of surplus nutrients from last year's fertilizer that will help buffer a Cana most Canadian farmers, not all, not perfectly, but will help buffer most Canadian farmers from, from not being able to put as much fertilizer on this year because, because of the high costs. A place like Rwanda with very, very sandy, thin soils, uh, they need the annual inputs of fertilizer quite desperately. So once again, we see a, a wedge effect driving a, a wedge between the, uh, the the rich north and the global south, so-called. And, uh, and and again, we see a thing that exacerbates or a function that exacerbates inequality in this world. And, and, and again, we just see another layer of this catastrophe uh, unfolding in front of us. Lenore, can you tell how much of the problems that you've all been describing so far are the result of the war and how much are the result of sanctions that have been put on Russia? Can we tell that yet? I don't think we can know entirely yet. And I do think it's really important that the problem is these problems are tangled with everything else going on in the mm -hmm. food system. And so when we look at Ukraine and Russia being large exporters of major crops such as wheat, that's important, but we need to remember that's not, they're not large producers when we look at the whole pie. And we could easily adapt if the rest of the world was just totally fine. But of course, it isn't. We have crippling labor crisis, we have the mm -hmm. climate crisis, 
Mm -hmm. um, usually we would be already figuring out how to account for the missing production and we wouldn't be worrying about what effect the sanctions were having, what effect the war was having. The reason we're worrying is everything else is just spread absolutely way for them. Hmm. Evan, anything you want to add to that in terms of w where you think the preponderance of responsibility lies, sanctions versus the war? Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a tangled web. It's a Gordian knot. I mean, I don't I don't think we can disentangle these things. I, hmm. I guess I my, my one concern, though, in this conversation is that it really does put us in a headspace, and I, I don't think this is a helpful headspace, that we can solve this problem simply by boosting production all over the world. And, and I think that what this is revealing is that at a deep and fundamental level, there are so many interlocking vulnerabilities in the food system that we need, we need a much more fundamental food system transformation and that, um, and that, yeah, we need we need to help farmers get access to fertilizer as a short term measure. We need to make sure that, the, you know, say, Canadian wheat <laughs> gets you know gets into places like North Africa. Those are really short, good short term strategies supporting the World Food Program to to do the delivery of the food aid. But that isn't going to solve the long term structural vulnerabilities that we're seeing uh, and we're falling prey to this year. And that requires. A, a deeper, more more nuanced mm -hmm. strategy. No, I take your point on that, but in in, in the immediate uh, situation that the world finds itself in right now, and Earth and Cousin, I'll bring you back in on this. Uh, I guess we need to have a better understanding of of which parts of the world, either right now or are soon going to be, uh, facing the brunt of the food shortage that you've all described. Well, we know that the direct effects of the of the war will affect those are who are net importers, uh, historical net importers. We've already seen and witnessed uh, protest because of high food prices. There's an expectation that uh, other countries like Egypt uh, that, that uh, are large importers from Ukraine and Russia will also be immediately affected. But there are also those countries that are far afield from Russian from, from Russian or Ukrainian imports, like Haiti, where because of higher food prices, high debt levels of the country, and inability to support the purchase of, of commodities at a higher price, and the challenges and impact of higher oil prices, and lack of production in the country, that we know they are, as you, look, we, as you think about a hotspot country, that's one of those countries that would easily be a hotspot country. But we can walk around the globe and identify those countries. For example, let me just add one more on here, and that's in the West Africa and the Sahel, where we are, have we recognize that the opportunity to increase production there in a follow-on to the challenges that they've been having with climate-related poor agricultural production, we the the opportunity to invest in um, increased access to foods the governments don't have the capital. Mm. And so trying to identify how we can not only provide the immediate humanitarian support that is necessary in those places, but also the tools that are necessary because we are three months away from the beginning of the planning season in Sahel. What is the work that the international community must do now to invest in providing the seeds and tools that are required to ensure the hope for that we don't expand the challenge even further because we've, we've failed to provide those farmers with the tools that they need. So I'll stop there because I can walk you around the globe and tell you <laughs> how this is going to affect so many countries. But um, that's that that, that, that just giving you those examples, hopefully will, will um, your viewers will recognize that this is a challenge that is affecting different parts of the globe and it will affect in different ways, but the res outcome will, in each of those countries, will, will is, is, is increased number of hungry people. No, indeed. I take your point on that. And I, and I guess, Evan, I mean, this may be a, a bit of a nuanced look at it, but but not every country presumably will be affected in the same way because some countries uh, depend on, for example, wheat in their diet more than other countries do. Can you give us a bit of a list of countries which would be sort of more dependent as opposed to less on wheat and therefore this will hit them harder? Yeah, I mean, 
that's it's it's a, that's a really important nuance and uh and you know something like a, a the fertilizer crisis is is affecting farmers everywhere the specific role of ukraine and russia as key global wheat exporters will disproportionately affect north africa and the middle east which are fundamentally have a lot of wheat in their diets as opposed to say asian countries where where wheat's super important but it isn't it isn't as central say to the diets as as rice as rice is so so again all eyes for me are on um North Africa, East Africa, the Middle East in particular, those are, are wheat-based countries. They import a tremendous amount of, of Russian and Ukrainian wheat. We know that um, about 10 years ago in, in the 2011 food price crisis, food prices started to rise on the backs of um, poor harvests in China and Russia, uh, with, uh, which meant that Russia that year chose to stop exporting into international markets. Um, to anywhere like they normally do, and and again, it was it was exactly in the countries that Ambassador Cousin just listed, Haiti plus the and 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 countries in the North Africa and the Middle East where we start seeing political protest, and it's not just hunger; it's people taking to the streets in in anger over political corruption and all sorts of other things, but sparked by by upset over over the rising price of bread in many instances. Well, that's a great point, Lenore Newman. I, I mean, we 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 got the Arab Spring, I think, or at least those countries got the Arab Spring. Uh, kickstarted in part by food insecurity at the time. Uh, what part of the globe are you looking at right now in terms of uh, where political and social instability might start because of the food crisis we're entering now? Well, I think one of the things is it's it's going to hit us here at home as well, which is mm -hmm. a little unusual. We're usually quite sheltered because of all the resiliency in the system, but. Uh, one of the things I'm watching carefully is uh, the North, North Americans are quite stretched right now because of inflation, and they are going to be walking into stores and going, wow, things are really expensive. They're going to mentally shift more of their budget into food because you can't shrink that budget too much because we have to eat. And uh, that means people will be spending less on other areas of the economy. And people are also going to be even more financially stressed. So I think this is a crisis that actually spreads right around the world. And there's very few areas that are going to be bystanders. Of course, we're going to see the most serious hunger in the Middle East, in uh, Northern Africa. We're going to see a bit of a supply crisis in South America because of the lack of fertilizer. But I think even here at home, we're not going to be playing our usual role of watching it unfold. We're going to see it at the grocery shelf. And we're very spoiled. We're used to spending between 6 and 10% of our take-home pay on food. For the first time in a long time, we're seeing that number rise quite rapidly. And um, so I think even here, it's going to have political implications, this mm -hmm. crisis. Can I get Ambassador Cousin on that as well? Do you imagine social and political instability in North America and Western Europe as being a potential outcome here? It could happen. Here's the reality. Many families, particularly the working poor families to, in, in North America and in Europe, are experiencing higher housing costs, higher fuel costs. Uh, there ha there's already a post-COVID, because of supply chains, higher food costs. Some, are, some economists are suggesting that globally food costs could rise another 10 to 15 percent. That is, is a reality that will affect those whose incomes have only risen probably the, the in comparison about 3 percent. And so the challenge of families trying to meet all of their needs will result in the kind of protest and political um, and, and, and political issues that we saw in the, the, the early days of COVID with those log lines at food banks when families could no longer afford food or empty shelves when there were no, when the effects of, of COVID uh, limited the, the uh, supply chain, uh, affected supply chains and products on shelves. And so th the possibility of that happening is quite high, but the opportunity for us 
to address that through food substitutions, to moving foods earlier, to making the, uh, the, 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 ensuring that we have our social safety nets in our countries as viable as possible is also uh, quite important for us to produce, perform that work right now on the front end. Well, Evan, let me read this off of National Public Radio's website because uh, the author of this piece uh, suggests another solution here. And here we go. Even with the loss of the contributions to the food supply from Ukraine and Russia, there would still technically be enough quantity left to feed the world. In other words, the only problem will be the increased price of that food. This in turn suggests that the immediate solution will be monetary. Okay, Evan, take us through that. Do you think this is a problem that money can solve? Well, it's such a good question, and and it's such an interesting quotation because it's, on some levels, the uh, the author of that statement is absolutely correct. If you if you add up all of the calories available on the planet and you divide it by all the people, there, there's more than enough. It's uh, 27, 2800 calorie, dietary calories available per person per day, but they're not distributed very well. They're also not necessarily the healthy calories. Uh, there's a lot of carbohydrate in there and there's not enough fruits and vegetables. So there's a nutritional deficit going on. Um, and, uh, and then there's food waste. Uh, you know, about a third of the food we produce is, is wasted. So on that level, it's, it's not a problem that will simply be solved by producing more. If, if, if it were only that simple, it, actually, this wouldn't be as complicated a conversation to have. But what we need to be doing is, I think, in the very, very short term, uh, supporting organizations like the World Food Program, hoping that the Canadian wheat harvest that's coming off, the winter wheat harvest that's coming off in the next, next couple of months uh, is, is, is robust. Uh, doing whatever we can to keep the the global trade mechanisms going to get the fertilizer that we've got moved, to get the grains we've got moved, uh, and and working at a multilateral level on that one. But at the same time, we, we have to be doing, I think, two additional things that are medium and longer term strategies. And one Ambassador Cousin just mentioned, we need a robust social safety net to protect the people who are left out of the modern world that aren't benefic benefiting from economic growth and opportunities, the, the marginalized communities on this planet, of which there are far too many, uh, we need to have a safety net to protect them, or those people will grow, uh, uh, be the source of tremendous dis unrest and, and, and human suffering. And then I think there's a wake-up call that the, the fundamental assumptions of the world food system, good grain, uh, good weather, seamless trade, all these things that we sort of assumed over the 20th and early 21st century were, were sort of fundamental. Well, those assumptions, assumptions are pretty rickety right now. And so I think we have to shorten supply chains, build resilience into the system that will cost money, which redoubles, uh, it, it increases the importance of doing social safety nets. But I think so. I think it's 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 in the medium and long term that we need to be building resilience uh, in our systems and and in the short term, hoping that we can get you know prairie grain in, out to Africa to keep prices down there. Well, I should follow up with Lenore Newman on that very angle. We do. I mean, the prairies, uh, right? Lots of lots of wheat there, uh, Saskatchewan. Lots of potash there, which you need for fertilizer. How how can Canada be part of the solution here? Well, I think we already are. Uh, part of the solution because the market is pushing uh, the planting of more spring wheat uh, than we usually would. And Canada does play an interesting role in that uh, we plant more spring wheat than a lot of other regions. So we do have the ability to pivot and feed into that supply. But I do feel Evans raised a really critical point in that uh, we're playing reactive politics here constantly. Mm -hmm. The last four years have been the food system stumbling from crisis to crisis. And the quote that you gave us is interesting because over the last few years, we've seen government write us checks for COVID and everyone was totally, yeah, we need to do that. And then recently for fuel costs, we are getting another little check and it's a bandage and it's important. We have to do bandage type things, but uh, eventually you do bleed to death if you only use bandages. And I think Evan is correct. We need to look at whether this idea of a globalized food system is now under threat by a larger series of interlocking crises. And yeah, the medium and long-term things, we need to start thinking about resilient supply that's local, that's intensive, we need to start seeing how we move surplus more rapidly around the system as it's needed. I think 
to use an overused phrase from the pandemic, we have to accept there is a new normal in the food system, and it's not as pleasant and easy as the period between the end of World War II and about 10 or 20 years ago. And we need to adapt to that. Well, you've all made that abundantly clear, unfortunately, during the course of our conversation here. But I think our viewers and listeners know a lot more about this now than they did half an hour ago. So can I thank Lenore Newman in Vancouver, British Columbia, Evan Fraser in Guelph, Ontario, and Earthrin Cousin in E, Netherlands, for joining us on TVO tonight and making us all a lot more knowledgeable about this issue. Many thanks, you three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.